the Center for Critical Thinking and Moral Critique, in concert with Sonoma State University, is proud to present videotape proceedings of the International Conference on Critical Thinking and Educational Reform. Thank you. Um, this is part of a series, as you know, and in the previous series we've sort of built up to this point, and I'll take a few minutes at the beginning to catch you up so that you feel that you have the basic foundation uh, to make sense of this session. And this session is focused on assessment, the foundation, and the following uh, session is on assessment, the tactics. And the distinction between the two is something like this. In order to do good assessment, it's very important to see how it is that we want students to assess their theory, uh, pardon me, their thinking, as they uh, come to comprehend what thinking is and what it involves. And the tactics uh, refers to that variety of structures that we bring into the classroom in order to make this happen. So we're going to be dealing with the foundation for it, and then the tactics will flow out of that foundation. Um, what do students need to know in order to assess their work? Uh, I think before we go ahead, let me just share a kind of common denominator for all these sessions. And it's this. In every classroom there are, from the point of view of critical thinking, three variables. The logic of reasoning, in general, what reasoning is, how it takes place, its nature, how it can be assessed. The logic of the content that is being taught, whether it's biology or literature or uh, chemistry. And then the logic of the student's thinking, the patterns of thinking, the modes of thinking, the nature of the thinking that the students bring into the classroom. And a successful classroom is able to integrate these. An unsuccessful classroom can be achieved in a variety of ways. If one of these is missing, it will not be successful. That is, you may yourself understand very well the logic of reasoning, and you may even deliver excellent lectures on the logic of reasoning, and you may thoroughly understand the logic of your subject but you may fail to engage the logic of the student's thinking, uh, in which case very little good learning will occur. Or you may very well understand the logic of your student's thinking, and you may uh, understand the logic of reasoning as a kind of abstraction, but you may not understand the logic of your content, and uh, this the students may end up with many misunderstandings, because though you're well-meaning, and though you're really into their heads, the content and the logic of the content is violated uh, because you yourself have not achieved a su uh, sufficient grasp of that content. And finally, but not least important, is understanding the logic of reasoning. Let me mention a little metaphor which I like to use, and it's this. Suppose, you, suppose I said to you, I'd like to teach your son to play basketball well, but I don't want him to know that we're playing basketball. I'd like to just sort of get him to play the game, but I'll never tell him it is a game or what the rules are exactly. But I'd like to get him to do it very well, sort of implicitly. You know, sort of along with doing something else. Uh, I think any basketball aficionado would say, impossible. Can't be done. 
You can't play basketball well without understanding the logic of basketball, without understanding what you're about, without understanding what makes excellent basketball excellent basketball. You have to focus on various things. For example, you have to focus on stroking the ball. You have to focus on squaring yourself to the basket. Now, how are you going to square yourself to the basket if you never mention squaring yourself to the basket? Of course, you have to bring in a little bit of the vocabulary of basketball. You have to talk about the game. You have to talk about the purpose of the game. All right, now, I think this is intuitive to us. I think we can see this. And yet, we are trying to teach reasoning on the model that I mentioned of not telling them. They don't know what reasoning is. They don't know how it functions. They don't know the parts of it. But we say we want to get them to reason well. We're going to do it implicitly. Can't be done. It can't be done. You want somebody to be good at reasoning, you've got to bring reasoning into the classroom. Reasoning has parts, you have to understand the parts, and reasoning has standards, and you have to understand the standards. It can't be a hidden agenda, because it won't be successfully done. So there are three of these things, and they all have to be there. You can deal with the logic of the, of the student's thinking, by the way, without telling them that you're dealing with the logic of the student thinking, because they automatically will bring that logic in. It's the only one they can use. That is, they can't learn your subject using the logic of your thinking, because they are not you, and they don't think like you, certainly not at the beginning of the course. And so there's no way that you could say, I'll substitute for the logic of the student's thinking the logic of my thinking. That can't be done. Everyone has to learn on their own terms. So that's the basic idea. Now, where does assessment come into the picture here? The top two are really combined in assessment. We are assessing, in fact, it's very difficult to assess one of these in terms of performance, student performance, without in some sense assessing all of them. That is, we are trying to get the logic of reasoning into the logic of the student's thinking so they can learn the logic of the content. Why? Precisely because content, as if you will like, a metaphysical reality, exists only by virtue of another metaphysical reality, thinking. That is, content that we bring into the classroom does not exist like blades of grass out in the actual natural environmental world. Content, as we mean it, is something produced by minds. And, there, and minds produce what they have in them by thinking. And so when somebody says, I don't know if I can sacrifice the content to focus on more thinking, they don't understand the logic of content. They simply don't understand what content is. Content is something discovered by thinking, organized by thinking, analyzed by thinking, synthesized by thinking, evaluated by thinking, transformed by thinking, if you take the thinking out, the content is gone. It's not there anymore, because it is not a thing in itself. It is a thought-pervaded reality. And so people who talk about this, they, they don't understand thinking and they don't understand content. They have in mind a kind of mythical thing in which knowledge exists in bits and pieces like atomic factoids, like particles in the universe, and somehow or another you could pass these particles to somebody without their doing this other process called thinking. Now, of course, there is something like that. It's the process that the tape recorder uses. So tape recorders get content in their way without any thinking. But the tape recorder doesn't get content in the significant sense. That is, there is no tape recorder that understands what's on its tapes. And therefore, if what the student is doing is functioning like a tape recorder, OK, yes, if that's what you mean by getting content, students can get some content. They're, by the way, not nearly as good as tape recorders. Uh, and 
Furthermore, they have a tape that erases itself in short order. And so if you play that tape back, you're going to be very disappointed. If you really want to see your words coming back at you, tape record it and play it back. But if you want content in the way that it's supposed to exist, and the way that it can exist in minds, then you have to use that which brings it into a mind, thinking. And only thinking will bring that content into the mind of your students. There is nothing else. And so if you say, the content's the main thing, the thinking isn't, I say, you don't understand what content is. If you say, the content is significant, then you're committed to the thinking. And furthermore, here's another side. Suppose somebody says, I don't care about content. I want thinking. There's a sense in which that's absurd, too. Because you can't think about nothing. And you can't think in such a way as to get good at thinking while, at the same time, not getting good at any content. There is no one who is just good at reasoning about nothing, or has got good at reasoning without learning anything of significance. And so there is no dilemma before us, content versus thinking. The two are inseparable. One doesn't need to worry about that dilemma. What one wants is as much content as you can learn, truly learn, through the thinking which most efficiently helps you to learn it. That's what you want. You want as much content, not an ounce less. But you don't want illusion either. So if you said, we're going to read 100 of the great novels of the Western world in this three-unit course, because that's what I want. I want, us, I want all of you to understand these 100 novels. Then this is self-delusion, massive self-delusion. It's not possible. It couldn't be done. Why you're thinking to say you're going to try to do it is like saying, I have brought in this 500-pound weight, and at the end of the course, you people are going to be able to pick it up. When they can't. It's, it, it doesn't make sense. So as soon as we outdistance the students' thinking, we've given up on them. And of course, they automatically give up on the content. They are in every class the way I was in, a, in one class called number theory. In this class, I was a math major at the time. The instructor did original proofs or you know, ver proofs he was working on in front of the class at USC. And it, took him, it would take him generally two or three weeks to get from the first line of the proof to the last line of the proof. And about halfway through the class, I, he had lost me. And for the next two weeks, I might as well be twiddling my thumbs because I didn't know what in the hell was going on. But he kept going forward. And so by De Morgan's theorem, we can deduce, as you can see, this. And then by this law, we get that correct. And then here we go. And on and on he went. It might have been good for him. It wasn't good for me. <laughs> it discouraged me. It, in fact, convinced me that I wasn't a math major. That was bad reasoning on my part. But nevertheless, I dropped math as my major and switched to literature. <laughs> and I am thankful. In a way, I should be thankful for that instructor, uh, because literature is so wonderful and beautiful. OK, so here then is the general theory that underlies what we're going to try to build foundational assessment on. So what do we want assessment of? Student reasoning as they attempt to master content, whatever the content be. It may be organized content as in a subject like biology or anatomy or physiology. Or it may be content from various domains as you read short stories that are about very different things. Or it may be content which focuses very much on your personal experience and it's the content of your life that is being focused on as perhaps in a psychology class where personal analysis might be right in the center. It doesn't matter. They're all content, and they all have a logic to them. They can all be understood well or poorly, deeply or narrowly, clearly or unclearly, precisely or imprecisely, accurately or inaccurately. The question is always the same, and the challenge is always before us. 
And the challenge, by the way, is to conform our thinking to the logic of the content that we have chosen. Now, because content is produced by thinking, it is always organized around questions and problems, because thinking does not think about what is not problematic. Thinking thinks about what is problematic, because it wants to figure out how to solve the problem. So novelists have problems, and the novel is the answer to the problems, and whether it solves the problems is a measure of whether the novel is a good novel or whether it's not so good a novel, although it could solve an unimportant problem and not be a good novel, I suppose. Um, but in any case, the question, the problem you pose, becomes a constraining factor on your thinking. Here's where intellectual freedom comes in. You can choose any problem you want to think about. That's your right. Once you've chosen one, you are constrained by the logic of that problem. You must conform your thinking to the logic of that problem. You have lost your freedom. At that point, you must now conform. And so if the question you raise is an empirical one, you must get empirical information. Otherwise, you're being dishonest. Now, if you're not interested in an empirical question, then don't raise one. It was your choice to raise one in the first place. But you raise it, you're stuck with it. You can't say, well, I'm going to answer it this way. Well, that changes the question. So if you answer a question of fact with an opinion, then you answer the question of opinion, or you misanswer the question of fact. And need I tell you, everything is not a matter of opinion. There are matters that are matters of opinion, but there are matters that are not matters of opinion. And a reasonable person does their best to distinguish the two, and there are also some matters that can be argued on both sides, which is to say that there are some matters that are partially a matter of fact and partially a matter of opinion or very difficult to understand as to what exactly they are, a perplexing kind of a question. But the main point here is there's an objective component to thinking in which the mind must conform itself to that objective component. If you're a novelist and you're writing a novel about um, migrant workers in the San Joaquin Valley, then your novel, if it's going to be a good novel, given the ordinary purposes of why one would write such a novel, it must be true to the life of those people. It cannot be anything you want. You can't make them other than what they are and have it be a good novel about them. Or you can say, well, I'm not concerned with them, but people who sound like they're them but they're actually very different, then we need to sort of know that or figure that out. Otherwise, we're going to be looking for some semblance of reality in what you create in that novel. So the main point here has to do with the constraint that the reasoning mind operates under. There is no freedom without discipline. You become a disciplined ballet dancer through the constraints of ballet. And if they have, were there no constraints, you couldn't achieve anything in ballet. You need the constraints for the achievement. And so there is no such thing as complete subjectivity in reasoning. If it was completely subjective, you wouldn't have to reason. If anything is true because you choose to believe it's true, then why reason about it? Just believe it. Don't waste your time reasoning. Reasoning is an attempt to figure something out. There must be something beyond you to figure out in order for reasoning to make sense. I dwell on that because we live in an age of subjectivity and radical relativism in which many people think they know, interesting contradiction, that everything is arbitrary except their last statement. That is, they don't recognize how, as soon as they open their mouth, they refute themselves. It's like somebody who says to you quite seriously, how do I know that I exist? Uh, the very question answers itself. The question would be unintelligible unless you existed, so don't ask me to answer it. OK, but the human mind is quite capable of contradicting itself. And we, are, we live in an age in which a certain kind of subjectivity is growing in society, and it undermines the very nature of education and makes our instruction much more difficult. 
uh, uh, because until we get beyond that, we can't get off the ground. And many of our students, often quite intelligent students, but totally undisciplined, will come in and think they really have that completely understood. OK, so now assessment. Remember the ballet image. image and developing your ability in ballet by learning what it is that a skilled ballet dancer can do, learning what the standards of ballet are, and so forth. You could put it this way for a moment. If I can get these two pieces of paper separated here. There are these dimensions to reasoning. Elements means the parts of it. Standards and traits are, is the evaluative side. They're the values. And then down at the bottom, the abilities, what you can do. What you can do with reasoning, what you can do with reasoning if you understand the parts and you grasp the standards. You see, then when the standards are embodied in you as a person, they are, they are part of who you are. Then, of course, they become highly intuitive, and your thinking becomes much more powerful, because it's not something on the outside of you that you're reaching for. And so when you're, when you're in ballet, when you lack balance, then balance is something outside of yourself you're striving for. You're trying to achieve it. But when you achieve it and it's part of you, then you walk with balance and grace and so forth. And it is not something you then strive to do. It's who you are. You are balanced. You are centered. You are the, uh, this or that trait. There is such a thing as to develop the traits of the reasoning mind so that it becomes a part of who you are. You don't struggle for clarity, you have a clear mind. Clarity of thought is part of who you are. Now, of course, you're never it perfectly, and so, yes, you do strive. But clarity becomes a part which, which is an intimate part of who you are, and other traits become part of you, which I, which I will just mention briefly. You are intellectually autonomous. That is, it isn't that you don't value the thinking of others, but you never substitute somebody else's thinking for your thinking. You realize that even if they're right, you still have to think their thinking on your terms to make sure that you buy into it. Secondly, you, ach you achieve and you, you have cultivated and engendered in yourself intellectual integrity. And therefore, you are not satisfied to be a contradiction. You are not satisfied to say one thing and do another, or defend this view on these principles and then ignore these principles while you are attacking that other view. You realize that you're responsible for your thinking. And you try to achieve integration and unity. You are intellectually humble which is to say that you strive to know what you don't know and not to claim what you don't know. So, for example, you try to say what you mean and mean what you say. Not more, not less. Exactly so. And so when I'm talking to my students, for example, I try to say what I mean and mean what I say, but often they assume I don't mean what I say or Often, they don't struggle to find out what I mean by what I say, as they don't see the notion of being precise, to say it exactly. I said this, I meant this, not two inches to the left, not two inches to the right, exactly so. I chose this word carefully. This is the word I wanted. Not that word, not that word, not that word. You're intellectually perseverant. The average high school student believes, that is when you interview high school students, you ask them, how long should you work on a math problem before it makes sense to give up, wait for somebody to give you the answer? 
average ants for five minutes. So you should work for five minutes at the max and then give up. Now, the mind can do very little quality work in five minutes. And so people who actually are that way, they lack intellectual perseverance. Then finally, not finally because there are others I'm not going to discuss, fair-mindedness. That is, you're not satisfied to win an argument. That's not what you're about. You want to understand and you want to be fair to the opposition. You don't want to defeat the opposition if you disagree with somebody with a trick. They may be right and you may be wrong, and if so, you'd like to find out so you could change your views and learn something new. You assume there's much that you don't know, intellectual humility. You have intellectual perseverance, you're patient to try to find that out, and you don't want to be unfair to somebody else in the process, uh, and so forth. So those are the traits and the standards, and then we need the elements. So what are some of the elements of reasoning? Very quickly, purpose, problem, information, conclusions, concepts, assumptions, implications, point of view. That is, whenever you're reasoning, you're reasoning for a purpose, you're raising some problem, you're using some information, you're interpreting that information, you're making some assumptions, you give some reasons, you come to some conclusions, and you do all this within a point of view. And just as a good ballet dancer can isolate different parts of the ballet and focus attention on it, a good reasoner can say, wait a minute, I think, I think I'm assuming something that I, I need to look at here for a moment. Or, wait a minute, what is, what is being implied by this sentence? Or, um, this conclusion seems right, but, but what's our reason for accepting it? How do we justify that conclusion? Or maybe we need to look at this from another point of view. Maybe I need to broaden my point of view here. You have to be comfortable making moves with the parts of reasoning. And these parts of reasoning that I've mentioned, purpose, problem, information, conclusion, implication, consequence, these are not technical terms. You find them all in ordinary dictionaries, and ordinary persons use them in ordinary life as they're not a specialized vocabulary from, quote, logic. Certainly you'll find them in logic books, but often not in a way that's particularly helpful. Uh, and so these terms have to be mastered, and the abilities to focus on them are part of that picture. Now, let's look for a couple of minutes at what's involved in thinking about your thinking in such a way as to get into some of the parts of it. Let me, by the way, first put an overhead here that takes those parts which I mentioned and presents them graphically. This is, this is available to you, so you'll be able to look at it in some length. It's presented here in a kind of diagrammatic form to sort of call attention to the fact that these are all interrelated. They're not BBs in a bag. And so reasoning has structures and they rely on each other. Put the question in this way, you'll seek different information because of it. You'll end up at a different conclusion, which leads to different consequences. Each of these things fits together. OK, you can look at that at your leisure. That's not our main focus here. And so I'm going to pass that by. And let me put this diagram up there. Uh, I'm not sure how clear these words are to you from where you're sitting. Each of these words are intellectual objects. That is, you don't find them separate from minds. You don't find interpretations in nature. You need a mind to create an interpretation. You don't have perspectives. Minds have perspectives. Do you see what I mean? So these are the stuff of minds. Minds create these things. And minds must be able to examine these things if they can be defective. 
And of course they can be defective. Any one of these things could be defective in some way. So your mind may be using one of these in a defective way. And therefore we need skills of identifying or recognizing these. That is, we need to be good at recognizing when we're generalizing or when we're using information or when we're presupposing a value or a standard. We need to be able to recognize it, focus in on it. All right. Now, of course, what is missing from this, here is the process in the center of the circle. These are the objects in the various segments of the circle. So I identify some information. Okay, what's missing? The standard. I identify, let's say, relevant information. Relevant is the standard. It's not enough to get information. But I put a lot of information in my paper. Yes, it was filled with information. Some trivial, some obsolete, some false. But not much that was significant and not much that was relevant to the topic. So we're not just interested in information, we want good information. You have to assess the information and you have to assess it in a number of different ways. Okay, So identifying these, but now we can switch to another sort of family of processes that have to do in general with comprehending. We can, we, we can say, okay, you introduced the theory of Freud, but I'm not sure you comprehended the theory that you were playing around with. I'm not sure you understood what this theory meant. And so by writing about it, maybe you learned a little bit, but I think you never quite got it sorted out. I'm wondering about the comprehension. Now, in, as we think, sometimes we have to comprehend our thoughts and feelings, because of course thoughts and feelings are part of thinking, and by the way, Thoughts and feelings, the affective, the emotional, these are covert thoughts. They are not separate from thought. They are a part of thought and they represent thought. And by the same token, all thoughts have affective implications. So if you give me a thought, I may find that thought to be very ho-hum to be very uninteresting, to lead nowhere of significance for me, and my affective response will reflect that. And so when we think, we usually try to think about things that matter to us, and when we think we're making progress on them, we feel good about that, and that feeling drives our thinking, because thinking is driven by feeling, and feeling reflects thinking. So those, that's another aside here. But besides uh, comprehending, we have to do, in thinking, a lot of applying, trying out, using. And so we have to try out an idea, try out a conclusion, try out a value or standard, see explore it in the context of some use. And there's a family of processes that are connected with that. And I'm not trying to necessarily cover everything here. There is evaluating that is part of thinking. And every intellectual object can be evaluated we can evaluate a theory, we can evaluate a generalization, we can evaluate a question. Is it a good question? Is it a significant question? Is it a trivial question? Is a question connected to another question that is important? Is it a clear question? Is it a profound question? Is it a fair question? Or is it loaded? Biased? And so forth. So we can evaluate questions, we can evaluate any other thing. 
And finally, but very importantly, thinking is creative. In fact, it is the nature of thinking to be creative. It cannot not be creative. The worst thinker is creative. But they're creating things that are distorted, wrong, prejudiced, biased, whatever. What's in our mind we have created. Your parents did not create your thinking. Your peers did not create your thinking. Television did not create your thinking. You created your thinking. You may not have known it, but you did it. And it came as a unique product, too. Because if we took your thoughts as your mind has created them, they would not be identical to anyone else's thoughts. And so if creativity involves uniqueness, then our thinking is unique. All of our thinking. And that's why novelists, of course, can write about any particular person. And it's interesting. Because every particular person is unique in their thinking. And that's what we explore. Not their looks. Not their behavior all by itself. But they're thinking. That's what makes them to be who they are. We have to get into them, into their minds. OK, so no question that thinking creates. But what is the, co the quality of that creation? Is it prejudiced? Is it biased? Is it narrow? Is it self-destructive? So to create, in one sense, just means to engender, to produce, to bring into being. I can create a very effective thumb screw, a very original mode of torture. But it isn't just that it be produced and that it be unique or that it be new or that it be mine. I still have to look for the quality because thought can be assessed for its quality. So what does all of this, what is all of this segment about, it's about the fact that students have to become students of their own thinking. They have to think about the parts of their mind and how those parts are functioning. They have to think about the intellectual standards that are appropriate to that. They have to think about thinking. They can't just think about content because their thinking is purchasing the content and if the thinking is defective, the content acquired will be defective. So this is not, again, something separate from content, because while you're thinking, you're thinking about some content. But you must be interested in how your thinking is functioning. And that's the important thing. Now, let's suppose you look at it this way for a moment. There's the external part of ourselves, our behavior, as viewed by Skinner or somebody like that. This body moves across this stage at this pace and so forth. This sized material object shaped in the form of a human and so forth, just the external behavior. And this is part of reality, because we not only think we act. We're not only thinkers, we're doers. But the logic of our thinking penetrates the logic of our behavior. And our behavior perfectly reflects the logic of our thinking at a certain level. But our thinking comes in two categories, the thinking we're aware of and the thinking we're not aware of. And when our behavior does not match our words, then there is thinking going on in us that we do not own up to. So, for example, this is a very common form of unexpressed thinking. The world should be designed with my pleasures in mind. It is not, and I resent it. Uh, I want you, so you should want me. And if you do want me, I love you. But if you don't want me, I hate you. And will do what I can to hurt you. This is thinking that exists in the real world. Many people think like this, but they don't think explicitly like this. It's there in their resentment. It's there in their being, but very much sub, sub rosa. And this is, of course, why we need the great field of psychologic psychology, which studies pathologic, the logic of the 
sick mind. And all of our minds are sick to some extent, unfortunately. Main sano and corpora sano, a sound mind and a sound body. Well, just as parts of your body are not in good condition, there are parts of your mind that are not in good condition. Unfortunately for most of us, large parts that are not in condition. And though, if you're talking about your body, there's something that you can do. You can strip, stand in front of the mirror and say, what kind of condition am I in? in basically, you know, insofar as that. But strip your mind and put the mirror of your mind to you and take a look at your mind. You immediately recognize what mirror? We don't have one. Yeah, that's the problem. The only person who can see the fitness and lack of fitness of their mind is a mind that is relatively fit. Because it's a mind that is skilled at seeing itself. It doesn't come from the mirror, the mirror comes from thinking. That is, the mirror for the mind is thinking about the mind. So a person who learns to think with discipline about their mind becomes impressed with a degree of their own ignorance. That is, they see how much they don't know. They're not impressed by how many people they understand, they're impressed by how little they understand of other people. And so it's like the paradox that if you are an unprejudiced person, you're simply a person well aware of your prejudices. And if you are a person who believes you're not prejudiced, you are a very prejudiced person and probably quite dangerous because you are possessed of a monumental self-delusion that you have no prejudices. In fact, prejudicial thinking is instinctive. It is, it is what the kind of thinking that we produce quite naturally. Think about it for a minute. Take the logic of the word prejudice, pre-judge, to judge before. To judge before what? Before you have adequate evidence or reason to judge. Do you ever judge a person before you have adequate evidence to judge them? Only always. I mean, that is the way we judge people. Before we adequately have, we know them for five minutes, we know them for a week, we know them under these circumstances, and we're quite ready to judge instinctively, prejudicially. And of course, notice that has nothing to do with negativity or positivity. The logic of prejudice is not the logic of negation, it's also the logic of attachment. I love you after five seconds. That's a prejudice judgment. Do you see? I couldn't know that I love you. I couldn't know that you're something that my mind takes you to be at a moment's notice. Okay, so what is this saying? It's saying that what we have to bring into our classrooms, all of our classrooms, is talk about the mind at work. So if I'm a historian, and I'm teaching history, therefore I'm trying to help students master historical content, therefore I'm trying to help them master historical reasoning, therefore I must reason in front of them, reason aloud, let them see my reasoning mind at work, let them see myself struggling with my mind to get it right, to rein it in, to constrain it, to bring it into the logic of the subject, to watch my prejudices in action, maybe even to admit my prejudices in action. I am a liberal historian of the following school. I tend to negate and argue against this other approach and this other approach. Watch it. You better read these other books outside of class because I am so committed to my approach that I don't even assign them. So there is probably some truth in those other views. You're going to have to get that yourself because I'm going to sell you liberal, a liberal reading of historical reality as best I can. Okay, so now you know my prejudices. You're going to see the liberal historical mind at work and now we're going to go forward and so forth and so on. This is intellectual honesty insofar as it is accurate and it's very healthy uh, because, of course, it respects the logic of history as it is. And what is the logic of history as it is? The logic of history as it is is someone's interpretation of something that is very complex and admits to more than one such interpretation. Who are you really? 
Is your mother's view of you, your father's view of you, your best friend's view of you, your view of you, your worst enemy's view of you? Which one is true? Well, a bit of this, a bit of that, a bit of this, a bit of that, and a lot more. And who knows which is which? Well, that's a problem about which we might reason. Do you see? So, and we must conform ourselves to that. We must not give up and say, well, it's any old thing you want it to be. Take your choice. But it does mean it's complex, and the mind has to respect complexity, not reduce it to a stereotype or a mask. One of the things that, that really irritates me is how many, quote, thinking skills programs insult the intelligence of any thinker, and anyone who uses them proves by the fact that they're using them, they're not a critical thinker. Uh, they're Madison Avenue, they're slick, and so forth. But that's another story. Okay, now, so what do we do in general in bringing this into the classroom? Let me put another and final overhead on the screen here. If I can find it, I can't find it, so I'll make it. That's okay. Those are not it. All right, here is what we're concerned with ultimately in our classrooms abilities to perform. To perform as a mathematician, to perform as a historian, to perform as an artist, to perform as a carpenter, to perform as... The performance is the thing. That's ultimately what we're after, some kind of performances. But the performances inevitably depend on some skills, and both of them defend, depend upon, to some extent, understandings. and may presuppose certain traits. Now, the hardest thing to try to assess and teach for are traits. I'm not going to talk about that now. But I think what we have to do is, in analyzing the logic of our subject, one of the things we have to say are, what are the essential understandings? And then we have to bring them in through reasoning and get the students to reason about those understandings. And, of course, remember the logic of the student thinking. We have to use the logic of the student thinking to get that. So if this is a history course, then one thing we want them to understand is the logic of history. And one of the, one of the ways that you might get them to do that is to have them discuss the logic of gossip, because they're very similar. And they gossip, so they participate in that logic. And if they analyze that logic and they understand it, they know what history is basically about. They know the fundamental character features of history. Namely, you take some information, you put it into a narrative from some point of view for some purpose. Now, when the purpose is vindictive and the narrative leaves out all the positive qualities, and tells the story to make somebody look worse than they are, we call that malicious gossip, not very good history. If it's done by a talented nationalist about the history of the country, we call it patriotic history. Because it makes us look good, it makes the people we like, we don't like, look bad, and some historians sell their soul to the devil and do this. And of course they always make money doing this, because people will pay you to make them look good. And history sometimes violates its own integrity to do that. But now, it's not just understandings in the abstract. We need skills, skills of doing it. That is, skills that involve the parts of it. And this might, might say, look, we're going to do some information gathering. I'm going to give you a historical topic. I'm going to mention a character. This is, this is 17th century. Um, colonial America we're talking about, for next time, I'd like to see what you can find out in the library on the following subject. Who, 
what was going on in this region of the country, I'll draw it on the map, at that time. That's all I'm going to say. I should go out and get that information. Then we're going to talk about how you got it, what's involved in getting it, and so forth. Then I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you how I got it. Then we're going to compare how I got it with how you got it, and so forth. All right, so now you're going from an understanding to a skill. But they can't do this if they don't get the logic of history, if they think, you know, this is some peculiar exercise you're doing. What an odd thing to do. He knows it, and he won't even tell us. We're going to all waste our time getting it, and he already knows it. Do you see? So they have to have the understanding to appreciate the skill. But this skill isn't the performance of history. It's part of the performance of history just one part of the performance of the history. So now you go through a variety of skills, and then you say, OK, the assignment is for everyone to write their own historical narrative about this subject. And I'll give you the subject. And I've made sure, uh, as far as I know, no one has written the historical narrative on this. So you're going to have to construct it yourself. You're going to have to do all the things. And it's going to be do it this time. We're going to work on it in class, in groups. We're going to be discussing the skills. We're going to be assessing the thing. We're going to be working for this. And hopefully, as we're doing this, you're going to be developing some of the traits that connect with being a good historical thinker. And hopefully, you'll see that this isn't something just about this class. This is about something you're doing every day of your life, namely reconstructing reality in a narrative and then using that reality to make decisions about who you are, what you are, what you value, what you don't value. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is something of the general foundational logic of assessment. And in the next program, we'll get into the tactics. Thank you very much. <laughs>